Hello friends, welcome to ePartshala. My name is Malvika Seth and I am an assistant professor at the OP Chindal Global University. I will be discussing the module titled The International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. This module will introduce students to the text of the ICESCR the debates surrounding its enactment, the nature of the obligations it sets forth, and some criticisms regarding its drafting and enforceability. The International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, that is the ICESCR, is one of the principal international human rights treaties. It is the primary international instrument that defines and seeks to enforce economic, social and cultural rights. These are rights aimed at fulfilling certain material needs such as food, water and shelter as well as providing access to the cultural life of the community. The expected learning outcomes of this module are as follows. After completing this module, students should know and understand first the ICESCR's historical origins, second the ICESCR's structure and key provisions and third state parties to the convention and concerns with enforceability. The first part of the module discusses the history of the ICESCR. The International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights is a multilateral treaty ratified by most of the United Nations member states. The treaty sets forth and seeks to enforce a range of economic, social and cultural rights. This part of the module discusses the history and the debates surrounding its drafting. Following the devastation of World War II, the United Nations was created in 1945 and given the task, among others, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights. This led to the creation of the UN Commission on Human Rights, that is, the CHR, in 1946. The Commission drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was announced by the UN General Assembly in 1948. While the UDHR provided an aspirational and comprehensive declaration of rights, it did not have any legally binding force at the time. The CHR was therefore tasked with drafting a covenant that would elaborate on the rights in the UDHR and give them legal authority. This covenant would require formal state ratification, meaning that states would have to consent to its terms before any binding obligations would be imposed on them. However, due to political differences, the CHR was unable to develop a single binding covenant. Negotiations over this instrument took place against the backdrop of the Cold War, which pitted the Western Bloc, that comprised of the United States and Western Europe, versus the Eastern Bloc, that comprised of Soviet Union and other socialist states. The delegations representing the Western Bloc favoured two separate covenants. They argued that civil and political rights were fundamentally different from economic, social and cultural rights. In particular, they believed that economic, social and cultural rights were more difficult to implement and enforce. The Eastern Bloc, however, sought to preserve the ESCRs within a single covenant arguing that all human rights are indivisible 
and interdependent, the Western Bloc eventually prevailed. The CHR drafted two separate conventions that were introduced and opened for signature in 1966 and came into force in 1976. They are the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that is, the ICCPR and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Along with the UDHR, these two covenants form the International Bill of Rights, which is the core instrument of international human rights framework. The second part of the module discusses the structure and key provisions of the ICESCR. The ICESCR consists of a preamble and 31 articles that define and establish a range of economic, social and cultural rights. The preamble makes clear that the ICESCR builds on the purposes and aims of the UN Charter and the UDHR. Drawing on the UN Charter, it recognizes the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice and peace in the world. It then cites the UDHR to proclaim that the ideal world where all human beings enjoy freedom from fear and want can only be achieved if conditions exist wherein everyone can enjoy the full spectrum of human rights, including civil and political rights, as well as the ESCR. Article 1 of the ICSCR is identical to the corresponding article in the ICCPR. It provides that all peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. Article 1 goes on to state that in no case may a people be deprived of its own means of subsistence. This provision was aimed at ending colonial occupation. In particular, it targeted Western colonization that had been brought under European control large swaths of Africa, Asia and Latin America since the 19th century. Despite its noble intentions, this provision is problematic for at least two reasons. First, it grants the right to self-determination to peoples. This deviates from the UDHR and other articles within the ICESCR, which grant rights to individuals, not groups, and are premised on the notion that each individual is entitled to an equal and indivisible set of human rights based on their inherent human dignity. Article 1, therefore, poses some theoretical difficulties. What does it mean for peoples to have rights? Are peoples to be understood as simply an agglomeration of individuals? If so, why not declare that everyone has the right to self-determination? The second problem with Article 1 is that it does not clarify which groups qualify as a people to be granted the right to self-determination. This provision must be read in conjunction with the UN Charter, which makes clear that the territorial integrity of UN member states is a priority. Thus, while Article 1 prohibits colonization, it does not seem to authorize groups within existing nation states to secede and form new states. Take for example, an oppressed minority group within a state that seeks its independence. This group might have strong arguments in favor of secession, but it would not qualify as a people under Article 1 of the ICESCR. Interestingly, India ratified the ICESCR with a reservation that confirmed this narrow interpretation of Article 1. India declared 
that it understood Article 1 to apply to the peoples under foreign dominion and that these words do not apply to sovereign independent states or to a section of people or nation which is the essence of national integrity. Article 2 of the ICESCR sets forth the general obligations of each state party to the covenant. These obligations are very broad and leave much room for differences in development and capacity. For instance, Article 2, Clause 1 establishes that every state party undertakes to take steps individually and through international assistance and cooperation, especially economic and technical, to the maximum of its available resources with a view to achieving progressively the full realization of the rights recognized in the present covenant by all appropriate means. Thus, states are not required to fulfill the economic, social and cultural rights of their citizens immediately or even in a specified amount of time. They must simply undertake to take steps towards fulfilling those rights in the future. This notion of progressive realization is central to the conception and enforcement of economic, social and cultural rights. It is based on a distinction between negative and positive rights. In short, civil and political rights such as the right to free speech and the right to life are considered negative rights because they can largely be fulfilled through state inaction. For instance, if the state refrains from passing laws that limit speech, then the right to free speech is largely upheld. By contrast, ESCRs are viewed as positive rights, meaning that the state must take affirmative steps to fulfill them. Take, for example, the right to food if the state does not provide food or access to food to those in need their right to food will be violated. Thus, unlike the right to free speech, mere state inaction will not suffice. The state must act positively towards fulfilling this right. The distinction between negative and positive rights is contested and in many ways is problematic. Nonetheless, it is important to understand this distinction in the context of Article 2 of the ICESCR. Since the ESCRs are positive rights, they require greater state resources for their fulfillment. The drafters of the covenant inserted into Article 2 the language of progressive realization to take into account differences in state development and capacity. The core rights protected by the ICESCR are located in Articles 6 to 15. They include the right to work under Article 6, the right to just and favourable working conditions under Article 7, the right to form and join trade unions under Article 8, the right to social security under Article 9, the right to family protection under Article 10, the right to an adequate standard of living, which includes adequate food, clothing and housing under Article 11. The right to health under Article 12. The right to education under Article 13. And the right to engage in and benefit from cultural life under Article 15. Each of these rights is phrased in broad terms. For instance, Article 10 protects not only the freedom to marry who one chooses, but extends special protection to mothers during a reasonable period before and after childbirth and to children who are to be protected from economic and social exploitation. Article 11 requires states to recognize that adequate food, 
clothing and housing constitute part of the right to an adequate standard of living and calls upon states to take measures including if improvements to food production, distribution and trade in an effort to recognize the fundamental right of everyone to be free from hunger. The third part of the module discusses state parties to the convention and concerns of enforceability. Within this discussion, we will first discuss the state parties to the convention. The ICESCR was adopted during a tense and divisive period in international relations. As discussed, political disagreements during the Cold War led the UN Commission on the Human Rights to draft two separate human rights covenants rather than a single comprehensive instrument. Though the Cold War has ended, concerns about the implementation and enforceability of the ICESCR still persist today. The United States, a prominent member of the Cold War Western Bloc, signed the ICESCR in 1977 but has still not ratified or acceded to the convention. Meanwhile, China, whose state policies aligned with the Eastern Bloc, signed the ICCPR in 1998 but has not ratified or acceded to that treaty. Still, both treaties have been widely adopted by UN member states. It is important to note that before they were finalized, the UN General Assembly stressed that the rights set forth in the two covenants should be regarded as interconnected and interdependent. For the most part, states have adopted this vision and have ratified both the ICCPR and the ICESCR. The ICCPR has 168 state parties, while the ICESCR has 162 state parties. The second part of this discussion is the enforcement mechanisms of the ICESCR. The ICESCR originally contained a single enforcement mechanism, which is set forth in Article 16 and 17. Article 16 requires state parties to submit reports on the measures which they have adopted and the progress made in achieving the observance of the rights recognized in the covenant. Article 17 elaborates on this reporting requirement, providing that states will file their reports in stages in accordance with a program established by the Economic and Social Council and that these reports may include factors and difficulties affecting the fulfillment of the covenant's provisions. Two observations are worth noting about Article 16 and 17. First, unlike the ICCPR, which establishes a human rights committee to monitor state compliance, the ICESCR vests this authority in the Economic and Social Council. While the Human Rights Committee is an expert body specifically charged with enforcing the ICCPR, the Economic and Social Council is the political organ of the UN and does contain such expertise. The Economic and Social Council is a political organ of the UN and does not contain such expertise. After the ICESCR came into force in 1976, it soon became clear that the Economic and Social Council did not have the capacity to effectively monitor state compliance with the Covenant. It therefore created the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in 1985 to assist with the reporting process. The committee is comprised of 18 experts who officially meet for a single three-week session every year in Geneva. Under the current reporting procedure, 
states must submit reports every five years according to detailed guidelines set forth by the committee. Second, the ICESCR's monitoring is limited to the self-reporting of state parties. There is no mechanism in the covenant to receive or act upon complaints. This again deviates from the ICCPR as the Human Rights Committee may examine complaints filed against the state party either by other states or by individuals whose rights have been violated by that state. On 10 December 2008, the UN General Assembly adopted the optional protocol to the ICESCR which would allow the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights to hear individual complaints. The protocol came into force on 5th May 2013 and today includes 45 signatories and 15 state parties. Thus, while the committee now has greater enforcement power, it does not have the authority to receive individual complaints against a vast majority of states. In the end, to conclude, let's recap some of the important points of the module. The International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, that is, the ICESCR, is one of the core international human rights treaties and is part of the International Bill of Rights. Following the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, Human Rights Commission originally planned to draft a single comprehensive covenant to give legal authority to the rights within the UDHR. However, due to political disagreements between the Western and Eastern blocs during the Cold War, the Commission eventually drafted two separate covenants, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that is the ICCPR and the ICESCR. The ICESCR is divided into a preamble and 31 articles. Article 1 declares a right of all peoples to self-determination, which raises some confusion because it is framed as a group right. It also does not specify what constitutes a people. This provision is generally understood to prohibit colonial occupation but not to authorize subgroups within nation states to declare their independence. India signed and ratified the ICESCR with a reservation that confirmed this narrow meaning of Article 1. Article 2 establishes the obligations of state parties to the covenant. It requires states to undertake to take steps towards achieving progressively the full realization of the rights set forth in the covenant. This broad aspirational language accounts for differences in resources and capacity among state parties and responds to concerns from the Western Bloc on the difficulty of implementing and enforcing economic, social and cultural rights. Article 6 to 15 set forth the core rights of the covenant. These include the right to work, the right to health, the right to an adequate standard of living and the right to culture among others. Concerns about the implementation and enforcement of the ESCRs persists even today. The United States has still not ratified the ICESCR despite becoming a signatory in 1977. Still, most states in the international community have signed and ratified the covenant. It has 162 state parties. Article 16 and 17 of the ICESCR require each state party to periodically report to the UN Economic and Social Council on their progress towards fulfilling the rights in the Covenant. Since 1985, the Council has been assisted by the Expert Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, 
which have implemented guidelines for states to follow in their reports. However, unlike the ICCPR, the ICESCR does not include a mechanism through which individuals and other states may report violations. It only allows for self-reporting by individual state parties. However, on 5th May 2013, the optional protocol to the ICESCR came into force. It authorized the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights to hear individual complaints with respect to violations of the ICESCR. It currently has 45 signatories and 15 state parties, meaning that individual complaints cannot be reported against the majority of states. With this discussion, I hope you have been able to understand the important aspects of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. For further learning, you are requested to refer to the e-text and self-assessment resources. Thank you for listening.